It's all good. You want that? Okay. Whoops. If I can watch where I'm going, that would be great. So let us take a deep breath and prepare for a word from God. So come. All who are thirsty, says Jesus our Lord, come. All who are weak, taste the living water that I shall give. Dip your hand in the stream. Refresh body and soul. Drink from it. Depend on it. For this water will never run dry. So come. All who are thirsty, says Jesus our Lord. It is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. So as Mike said, today we're going to take it from uh, from Micah, I wanted to say Micah, Isaiah, about how he would love to have a relationship with us and to pull up a chair. And if I could get to the right passage, we'll be in good shape. So hear these words. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear to me and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make a covenant with you, an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I, am made, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the people. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will have abundant pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is the word of God for the people of God, and God's people say, thanks be to God. All righty then. Who's a channel surfer? Nobody? Oh, come on, Trudy. That's my girl, Hector. All right. I don't have a television yet, but, you know, I'm sure what I did have when I was a surfer, nonetheless. Um, But that's that where we drop in on our favorite programs and movies just to get a sense of a scene that we like. And then we click it to go somewhere else. And while this isn't a bad for TV and entertainment, the execs like this, it is death to discipleship. So if you are a cable TV or Dish Network subscriber, you've noticed at any given time of the day where it scrolls the menu of what's on, you can see the same movie time and time again, day after, I mean, you know, hour after hour. It's the same movie that runs across. And there's a reason for this. The network executives know that people with a remote control in their hand don't always want to watch the entire movie. They would rather drop in or stop by a movie just to catch one particular scene. After watching that scene, they then surf on to another movie and drop in on it. So, for example, in um, the scene for uh, Pretty Women, uh, Julia Roberts, right? Her character um, tells off this sales girl because she wouldn't wait on her a few days before because of her doubtful reputation. So she looks at her, she comes in with all these bags and boxes, and she looks at this girl, and she says, you work on commission, don't you? And the girl says, "Uh uh-huh. She goes, big mistake, 
big mistake. And then she walks out. I don't know if you guys remember that scene, but it was kind of hilarious. And then there is a scene from Facing the Giants that I absolutely love, where the coach blindfolds one of his star leading players, and he asks him to crab walk just a few yards with a teammate on his back. Do you guys remember that? And instead, he has the courage and the strength and the guidance from his coach to make it across the whole field. So nearly any hour of the day, one can find these movies and others rolling across the screen, and millions of people drop in to watch no more than 15 minutes of their favorite scene. And it seems perfectly normal in a culture of convenience, a twitch culture of shrinking attention spans, video mania and instant gratification, a harmless habit perhaps, when we don't have anything else to do, like say read a book. Nobody does that anymore. Still, all habits, even the most harmless ones, have a way of shaping our lives including our imagination and our capacity for faithful living over the long haul. Our habits are those practices that will make us who we are. And if we get used to 15-minute fluff breaks, will we have the capacity for an hour of thoughtful reflection or deep conversation with the ones that we love who need us at the end of the day? Maybe, maybe not. But if your attention span is shaped to take in a pleasurable 15-minute gulps, it's less likely that you'll be able to give your full attention to anyone or anything, including God, for more than a few minutes at a time. This is a subtle way that habits work in our lives, and we don't notice the effect until much later. And even then, we may miss the reason for our actions. And so here's the kicker. Too often we approach discipleship as something that we can drop in on or stop by whenever we feel like it. In fact, the common complaint about us Christians is that too many of us are just Sunday Christians. But we're not Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday Christians. Christians one day a week, while checking our faith at the door for the rest of the week, Drop-in movie habits mirror a spiritual crossover trend that most of us would rather not admit to, a style of drop-in spirituality or drop-in discipleship where we nod to God for, for a few quick devotional minutes and then we're on our way, business as usual. A little taste of upbeat worship here, a sip of Bible reading there, not too deep and nothing challenging our imagination. Oh my gosh, and don't think outside of the box. It's this momentary feeling of satisfaction, just like a little movie viewing of our favorite scenes. But if that's all we ever have time for in our lives with God, then it's a false comfort a habit that will keep us from going deeper with God and drinking deeply from the well of life. This sort of religious consumerism, I guess we can call it, is in direct opposition to a mature life with God, growing in wisdom and faithful discipleship. Growing in our relationship with God is not going to happen with just a little dip here and a sip there. Such forays into tempted spirituality frame phrase us, freeze frame us into this spiritual infancy, perpetually clutching our spiritual sippy cups and the way we look at things. Don't make me learn anything new. God has something much different in mind, a life that is far deeper, far richer, and more fulfilling than just a quick fix. And this is where Isaiah comes in today. The prophet presents a different vision in which we're invited to embrace the abundant life in the presence of God. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And if you have no money, come, buy, and eat. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, as Mike was saying. And eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. What this suggests is not just a drop-in or drop-out discipleship, 
but more like a drop-by, stay-by discipleship. It kind of reminds me of the Sunday Italian dinners that I grew up knowing and cherishing. It was the best part of my childhood. We didn't just eat. We sat and we visited. We talked. We lingered. We enjoyed the company of those who sat around the table. We spent hours engaged in conversation. And the food was just the invitation. So let's look at the imperatives of these texts, just words that we're going to pull out. Come, in verse 1, God sets the table, but we have to pull up the chair. The disciple has to respond to God's faithfulness by taking action on their own. We cannot force God on anyone. The surrender has to be our idea. And if anyone tells you that deprivation is a way to God, then, my friends, you are doing it all wrong. Buy, verse 1, or buy into, commit, take a step, take a leap, take a plunge. Eat, verse 1, partake, experience, taste, savor the goodness of God. Listen. Pay attention, discriminate, be attuned to the voice of God and the breath of the Holy Spirit, and tune out competing voices, whether cultural, secular, religious extremist, or the voice of entertainment, culture, peers. Hear me. Fix the spiritual outward appearance so that God is the voice that you hear. Get rid of the noise and the interference that can drown out the voice of God. Dig out your spiritual earwax and reduce the voice that that reduces God's voice to a muffle. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Verse 6. Pursue single-mindedness. Search diligently for... Make the presence of God a priority. Take advantage of the opportunities to walk with God while you still have them. Verse 7, forsake. Abandon whatever doesn't work for your relationship with God. That means toxicity, negativism, false witness. Decide what is holding you back and let those other things go. Which brings us to return to verse 7. After letting go of the bad, grab the good. Turn to what is right, good, and positive. Turn to God, to forgiveness and mercy. Because you can't do those things, what is right, what is good, what is positive, unless you repent, ask for forgiveness and mercy. That's what Lent's for, right? So Isaiah seems to acknowledge that most of this is counterintuitive, and that's what we're reminded of in verse 8 and 9, that the way we live life is based on a different paradigm or construct than God. It's a matrix that most will not understand because we continually put God in a box and we force our language on God, and that's why I have such an issue with literalism in Scripture. Because here's what God says. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. This is the heart of it. If we order our lives according to conventional wisdom, culture, our wisdom, then none of this is going to make sense. But if we come and buy into a higher reasoning, a different way of doing business, a divine wisdom, We will align our lives with a divine purpose. The life that God invites us into is not drop-in relationship or one that involves a few minutes here and there whenever it's convenient for us. Rather, the mature life of faith with God is one that feasts on the riches of a deep and abiding relationship with God. It's not a fast food religion, that God wants from us, and the prophet tells us that's much more like a long, sumptuous meal, lingering over that meal, savoring the taste, enjoying the conversation and the company. This kind of deep maturity with God means spending the necessary time pursuing this relationship. Kind of think about when you first dated your spouse. You spent a lot of time wooing, right? Courting. The kind of time that one would give any pursuit, to any pursuit that's worthy of anybody's full attention. Give that to God. 
So again, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and labor, for that which does not satisfy? Indeed, Isaiah's question should be hung on a banner over the entrance of malls, places of work, and yes, even our churches. The poet Mary Oliver seems to ask a similar question of us. Tell me, she says, What is it that you plan to do with your wild and precious life? What will we do? We will come. We will buy. We will eat. We will listen. We will hear. We will forsake. And we are going to turn to God who calls us to himself. God so desires that relationship with us. And so many times we turn away because we're just too busy. So dropping in or stopping by is not enough. Discipleship is an adventure that we want to be a part of from start to finish. So think, pull up a chair, linger, taste, savor, savor for your Savior. Amen. So what I'd like to do right now and this is up to y'all. 